Chinese cousin of Troodon, the one they call Saronathoides. That's the second. Yeah. Look, look, that's the, uh, the raptorial one. Yeah. Look at, oh, look at yeah. the joint. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's fantastic. Although the bones themselves are tiny, the magnitude of the find is of enormous proportions. This particular specimen is not a mature one. Uh, this is the femur, for example, or the upper leg bone. And you can see it's actually quite short, considering it's a man-sized animal normally. We're looking at a, a baby, therefore, uh, maybe quarter grown. And uh, despite the fact that it's interesting from being just a baby, it's also interesting because it's the most complete hind leg known for this particular dinosaur. People always assume that dinosaurs are well known, and in fact, it's, it's exactly the opposite. We don't know dinosaurs all that well, any of them. And here we have an opportunity, because the specimens are fragmentary, because they're small, we have an opportunity to study very detailed anatomy on these animals that we sometimes can't on the bigger ones. If you look at the claws, for example, the claws are very sharp and is obviously a claw that's used for uh, ripping and tearing its prey. In addition to being the smallest specimen known to date of that particular animal, it's also the most complete as far as the hind foot goes. And uh, so although the specimen in itself isn't very big, it's an extremely important specimen scientifically because it'll give us information on that particular animal that we don't have from any other specimen in either Mongolia, China, or Canada. You know, get another beer? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll give you two. <laughs> By the third week, the discoveries are becoming overwhelming. Just keeping track of the riches takes up more and more of the team's schedule. What we're trying to do here is catalog all the specimens as they come in. Uh, this way we can catalog 50 or 60 specimens a day, as opposed to having to catalog several hundred at the end of the field season. This is a metacarpal rather than a metatarsal. So this is in the foot, this is in the hand, this oh, is Elmosaurus. Ah, OK. And it's uh, pretty diagnostic. It's very slender. I don't know how you remember all this crap. Mm -hmm. Amazing. <laughs> I guess it's like learning a language. Yeah. yeah. No, it's just a matter of looking at it. It's like learning things. Chinese. <laughs> you know, identifying bones almost like identifying humans, but visually. At first, they all look the same, but once you become familiar with them, it's, it's just like your friends and so on. That they look more and more different every time you look at them. There's differences in heights, there's differences in breadths, there's differences in, in how the eyes are and so on. Dinosaur bones or any bones of any animal are, are very much the same. That They may look very similar at first, but as you get into it more and more, you recognize the differences. Ankylosaurus metacarpal. Troodon metatarsal. Give me that, give me that, give me that. Um, a cheese flavored doggy biscuit. Each day seems to bring an even bigger find at Bayan Mandahu. But the find of the season, and perhaps the entire hunt, is made by project initiator Brian Noble of the Xterra Foundation. So far, for the past 20 minutes, I hadn't found a thing. And then. When I came around a corner, I looked upslope and noticed in the sands several, several fragments of white material. So what I did was continue up the slope, finding fragments, which is quite typical because ultimately in this, in this whole game of looking for, for dinosaurs, uh, you're following traces up the hill. And then at one point I looked up, and over here I saw two fairly large pieces of white bone. So I approached those and had a look at them, and they were in the slope on one shelf down here and another slightly higher. And between the two of them, I had a suspicion that what I, what I had was a skull, but I didn't know what it was. And then shortly after that, three tiny little teeth turned up, and each of those teeth were, uh, were ankylosaur teeth, really characteristic teeth, almost like a little arm with a hand on it, with little bumps, and I've seen these many times in Alberta. And so I guess that perhaps what we had was an ankylosaur here, particularly after having come across the valley from collecting one on the other side. But I figured the next thing to do would be to, would be to bring Phil in and let him have a look at it. I hope the uh, rest of the skull turns up, but I'm not too optimistic, actually. I just hope the wind didn't take the teeth off. Uh, I'm still 
Ankylosaurs, or armored dinosaurs from this age, are extremely rare. Young ones are virtually unknown. Anything we find on this thing is going to be important. I mean, you can't, you can't go wrong on it, can you? Let's see what we got back here. Looks like there's some more bone going in this way here. All that was known about the behavior of ankylosaurs until this find was that they were probably plant eaters. But this is the find of a lifetime. There is more information here than in all the theories and all the books. Curry calls in the geologist to see if this could have been the site of a collapsed dune, or if perhaps there is another explanation. It almost looks as if um, you know, they got caught in something pretty sudden. I mean, it wasn't a watering hole, obviously, or something that dried up and they just died together. Mm -hmm. It looks like they were buried or, or something. Yeah. Slump or a storm or something like that? I would guess a storm. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Is this possible? Yeah. It's a pretty amazing story. I don't, I don't know what you can do with it. Uh, if you can come up with some more details, it would help out. Well, I look around. In this, a science of hunches, the dinosaur hunters are into a sure thing. For here, on this very patch of sand, the Gobi claimed the lives of 12 baby ankylosaurs. That's your next baby curled up. That's nice. That's something. Yeah. yeah, right on. Another skull. So that body's curled right up, eh? Right here? Right there. Oh, yeah. Oh, teeth? No, no, no. That's front, front of oh. here. Teeth will be down oh. here. Right. Good show. <laughs> right on, number four. Today, we realized that one of the reasons we couldn't sort out what was going on in this quarry was simply because we weren't dealing with one animal at all. We were dealing with several. So it appears now what we're looking at is, is not only an interesting specimen from the perspective of what the animal is doing, but because we have a mass death site of at least five individuals of dinosaurs that are all about the same age. And what that indicates is that we're also looking at um, perhaps a group of dinosaurs that have been growing up together, that they hatched and they've remained gre gregarious um, and remained in association with each other and possibly even were with a parent at the time. Most of the rock in this particular area was formed in arid desert conditions. So in fact, what we're looking at is, is the side of an old sand dune. And uh, the angle on the sand dune indicates that it was very unstable. And it's possible that these dinosaurs were clustered together seeking refuge from one of the sandstorms that still rips through this region very regularly. And we're either buried by the sand coming over the top of the dune and, and therefore smothered, or perhaps um, a massive slump from the top of the sand dune that just buried them all. These ankylosaurs will go on to become the highlight of an international traveling exhibit. But first, the exacting work of freeing them from the stone which has invaded their skulls. Yeah, it gets its own character as you go along. Uh, this guy, he's got a bit of a hair lip, as you can see. Uh, quite the overbite. Missing a few teeth, sort of like Popeye. Eh? And the old <laughs> sideways squint to it. Uh, yeah, they, they get their own personality after a while. Every skull's different. If you look at the one in front, uh, he's got a bit of a protruding jaw. Looks kind of Cro-Magnon. <laughs> this one's a lot better. <laughs> this is more feminine. This one, a she, <laughs> not a he. 
it's just a personality you impart upon your specimen. Uh, everything you work on, uh, they become either cute or ugly. 